Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from the lovely land of Oregon, where, let's see, pot is legal. You can kill yourself if you want to. Uh, well, now be careful about that. That's end of life. Uh, well, I mean, I suppose anybody can. What are they going to do if you accomplish it? But you're talking about death with dignity laws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my ex-wife, Ronnie. And uh, uh, she lives in in Oregon, which is a beautiful place. You know, I'm. Uh, you know, that's true. It, it doesn't get more beautiful than that, and uh, uh, unless you guess, of course, Harlem is more beautiful than Oregon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, if I go down to the, if I go down a couple, but five, uh, six blocks, uh, I go to the park, and Central Park. It's a beautiful park, but it's not natural. You know, it, it's it's a phony park. You've got real parks. Well, they're not parks. They're actually woods and hills with trees all over them. Yes. So. And. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it's very pretty yeah. here. It's not New York City. Yeah. So uh, how's how's the old? Is he? Uh, uh, she had a little touch of the pancreatic cancer. <laughs> Just a little touch. A yes. touch of the pancreatic cancer. Uh, uh, no, that, I remember that line because I heard the story of a little Richard once on why he couldn't make an appointment, and he used the excuse, I've got a touch of the cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, So I always, I always remember that line and use it in whatever situation I can <laughs> apply it. But... Uh, uh, so uh, how's the cancer going? Well, I seem to be cancer-free. The other side effect <laughs> that nobody seemed to know about that put me in the hospital two different times for a week in April yeah. was an internal bleed. Yeah. And it took them two different tries through uh, to fix it yeah. and then put a stent in, actually two stents. I thought stents were only for hearts, but it turns out they have other uses too. Yeah. And so I went for a follow-up visit. Oh, since then, did I tell you last time? I had gained a... Oh, dear. Hold on a second. How do I make this stop? Uh, just hang up um, on them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that may happen again. I'm sorry. It, it, uh, where was I? Oh. Forgot. Uh See now there are two old people here, and when two you and when you say where was I, when you say where was um, I, I have to remember. So I should have a third person here to say where was right, exactly. I when she was with. <laughs> anyway, I went to see the doctor who performed this thing to fix everything inside yeah. that would take care of the bleed and make and uh, and make everything better. And oh, and oh, and what I had to do after that is take blood thinners. And so I, did I tell you I had gained a new skill, that stabbing myself in the abdomen oh, with yeah, a syringe yeah, yeah, twice yeah, a day? Yeah, yeah. My God, is that no fun. And uh, so yesterday, everything, they did an ultra scan, everything is working fine, and now he switched me to pills. I don't have to jab myself with a needle every morning and night now. Yeah. And I can't tell you how much that makes me happy. Folks, if you're, <laughs> if you're younger, just get used to this. This is what it's like to get older. So, uh, you know, uh, but you're alive and that's what we care about and you're healthy and you've been given the all clear for the time being and we hope it stays that way. And, you know, um, you got the most dire uh, diagnosis that anybody could get. And Not he a good one. <laughs> and here, here you sit today, cancer free. This is, it's a rare story when it comes to pancreatic cancer, you know. Pancreatic cancer is one of those diseases where when you get it, they just say, go home and say goodbye to everybody, you know. You know, it's, it probably was happening before, but it seems to me, since this happened to me and since I am better now, and I like to just get on with life and not have to think about it too much, is that everywhere I turn, there are references to pancreatic cancer. Yeah, yeah. Most especially, on television dramas and they all use exactly the same line somebody says where's joe and the other person says oh joe got joe got pancreatic cancer he's not coming back he'll be dead in two months thanks a lot yeah and yeah. uh 
you know, and, and then there was a moment I was all stretched out on the gurney. They're taking me in to do all of this work that they're going to fix my my bleed inside and, and, and insert the stents. And there are a whole lot of people in the room. You can't imagine how many people in the room for what is supposed to be pretty simple because they didn't cut me open. They go through a little teeny hole in your side to do this. And some doctor I'd never seen before, if he introduced himself, I don't remember his name, um, he came up and started speaking to me about this procedure that was about to happen. And apparently, and he seemed to not understand where it came from. So I said to him, you know, this all grew out of all of the surgery, the Whipple surgery from pancreatic cancer. But now they tell me I'm cancer free. This guy who I never met before, I don't know why he was in the room. He was not the surgeon. Right. He said, well, you know, it always comes back as they put me to sleep. Oh, 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 that's really good. That's <laughs> great. Great fuck. Uh, next, who next, does things like this? next, we're going to give you a class on bedside manner. You know, <laughs> you know it always comes back. <laughs> it doesn't always, but he's not wrong either. Well, it does it, sometimes. It's not back now. You look healthy. You look happy. You know, what could be better? Um, I, I just didn't appreciate it at the last moment before they put me to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, that's the way it is. It's when, and but how many? There were a whole bunch of doctors there then watching this. And oh, so there, on. you know, there were doctors and anesthesiologists and nurses and I don't know all kinds of people because it was a very special kind of surgery called interventional radiology, and they just make a little tiny hole wherever they need to go. Yeah. And teeny tiny hole, and then while they're manipulating their instruments through that teeny tiny hole. They're watching and following what they're doing on a screen that's about the size of, oh, let's say the largest home TV screen. Yeah. Really huge. Yeah. And um, and that's what they're doing. They're manipulating stuff inside your body, but they're watching what they're doing on their screen. You know what they Pretty should do? They should do is as long as they've got this feed with this picture of what they're doing, this should be like a cable channel for that. <laughs> no. I'll bet if you looked on YouTube, you could find all kinds of surgeries. I never tried. Have you? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I would imagine there is probably a channel where they show operations happening. In fact, there is. Maybe not live, but maybe, you know, I think there is, because years ago I had a friend who had a satellite dish. In the old days when you still had satellite dishes that, you know, uh, picked up all the networks and things like that and all the feeds that the networks were doing. And there was this one feed... I think of operations by people. Not li I would bet they don't do it live. I mean, what are you going to do if the patient, you know, no, if they I think, don't make I, it? I believe <laughs> it was live, and we were fascinated by it. We would. It was like our favorite channel. I mean, you weren't supposed to be getting all these channels, but people were with their satellite dishes, and uh, so the ultimate reality show. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Why not? You know, everything else were Everything shows. else is on TV. We have reality shows everywhere. One's called The White House, you know. <laughs> by the way, by the way, as long as, you know, because when, when Ronnie and I talk, excuse me, younger people, but, uh, you know, fuck you. Uh, we're, we're talking about stuff that's important to us. Uh, uh, this whole new thing they've come out with saying that Medicare is going to run out of money by 2026. I've that, just been wading through it all, yes. Yeah. And all I could think about was, didn't they steal that money from us a while back to pay for a war? Like when they went into Iraq? Didn't oh, they oh wait, wait, wait. Hold on. You're confusing the Social Security Trust Fund with Medicare. Yeah. Both were reported on by the, the trustees report came out this past week. Yeah. And I've been wading through all of the media coverage yeah. of it. There's a trust fund for Social Security. Medicare doesn't work that way. They take in money and they pay out money. And what they're saying on Medicare, not Social Security, is that there will be less money coming in or more people on Medicare or a com prob more likely a combination of both. And it will no longer cover as much as it's supposed to. So that by... And, and the other one that you're confusing it with is Social Security... Which, but they did steal from us on Social Security, right? 
Well, it's not it's not the same thing. It's not exactly that. Um, there's a trust fund where the excess money that's not spent on Social Security has always gone into. And every president, every single one since Roosevelt, has taken money out to spend it elsewhere, but replaced it with certain kinds of government bonds that can that have to be then when they need that money then they have to turn those in yeah okay. so depending on people's leanings political leanings they will tell you that it is now out of money as of whatever date i've forgotten what year they said it's out of money no it's not because the government has never defaulted on those bonds those are the same kind of bonds foreign countries buy um, now there's always a first time and that the, the shortfall as of that year, I've forgotten what it is, 2034, yeah. 22, I don't remember. Um, the shortfall is 21%. Now we could fix that in a variety of ways, which we people with any thoughtfulness have been calling on the government to do for many, many, many years, mm -hmm. for two or three or four, in, uh, administrations, which is one of the ways that would help is to, um, have people pay into Social Security on their entire salary. Right now, the right, cutoff is right, about 125000 Right. right. Um, and just raise that. I mean, it's, you know, why not? People making under that amount of money pay into Social Security on 100% of their income. Why shouldn't everybody who makes more money pay that? There are other ways of doing it, too. The other thing that's made Social Security in, in, in an attempt... I guess to heh, save money or something is they've been closing social security offices and shutting down phone lines to social security offices all through the co country over the past few years. And that makes long, long, long lines when people have to deal with social security and takes forever to get anything done and they're always overworked or they're not answering the phones. So they've already been chipping away at social security in a variety of ways. It needs to be fixed, and our, All right, but and our my, my representatives need to do yeah. something. My question is this. Had they never taken money out of the Social Security Trust Fund, there would probably be no money problem. Because you, I let, 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 you, well, you and I don't know that. Let, we don't well, have let's think of it logically, though. Uh, how long? But the money is there. I just explained to you yeah. how the money is there. Yeah, yeah. But but apparently it isn't because they keep having these dour uh, descriptions that no, even... no, no. That's only how a certain political spectrum describes it. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, they understand more how it works, and they're not using it as a um, as, as something to hammer everybody over the head with, because that that's their excuse for oh, we have to get rid of Social Security. Well, I mean, the fact is that Social Security money is mine, and I can't help it that I've lived this long and I've collected more than the average person would, you know. And they want to, they they want to raise the age, or they're every year they're raising the age of Social Security and when you can get it, when they really should be lowering it, because well, no, you, I don't think so. Well, I if think you, most if, of us are healthier longer. Yeah, but who can get hired at sixty years old? Well, that's the other problem. You know, yeah. there's always it's always more than just one problem. There are many things that that play into any decision about any big thing. In this case, Social Security, and one of them is is that it's you know age discrimination in the workplace begins as young as forty or forty five. Yeah, yeah. And I don't understand. I think by forty or forty five, when think about your career and mine at forty or forty five, I was just hitting my stride. I was just starting to get really good at that age at what I did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then they tell me I, they don't want me to work anymore as soon as I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no. The, the, well, let's face it. A lot of companies don't want older people, not because of any incompetence. As a matter of fact, they probably are at the, many of them when they reach into their 60s are at the top of their game because they've gained more and more and more knowledge about the craft that they do. Exactly. But they don't want you old people because you want more money. You expect more money. Whereas they can hire a 20 year old and he's happy to be making shit. You know what I'm saying? Well, the problem with that is, is how many mistakes is he going to make? How, if he a problem comes to him he's never seen before, how is he going to know how to t handle it, he or she? Um, 
and there's no reason, I mean, certainly you should always have young people in the office too, but they should work their way up to the jobs that are more complex and therefore pay more. Didn't they used to be called apprentices? <laughs> Do we have, I wonder if there are any kind of jobs that take apprentices well, I think anymore. I think unions still have apprenticeships. Uh, because, you may have plumbers, things like yeah, that? Yeah, because they figure that if they're going to be a union and they're going to guarantee to the person who is using a union plumber that they're getting a qualified plumber, that the people who want to become plumbers should serve an apprenticeship so they can learn the craft. You know what? They don't call them apprentices, but all of my doctors are at this big medical center that is a teaching yeah. medical center also. Yeah. And so... I, when I was there yesterday, the doctor came in and he had a young man with him, and he said, this is one of my students. Do you mind if he sits in with us? And this has happened all through this year that I've spent way too much time with doctors at this medical center. And um, and that's their apprenticeship. There's the, the, the physician that I had who did the original Whipple surgery a year ago. He would come and see me in the hospital room afterwards with about four or five people on his team. One of them had been working with him on learning how to do this kind of surgery yeah. for several years. And then they were kind of stepping well, stones down yeah. until one was introduced himself to right. me as it was his first day on the team. He was a new medical student or new medical intern. So there is an apprenticeship in the medical world. Well, they, oh, they the, just don't call it well there is an apprenticeship in the medical world that we all know about. It's called internship. That's basically well, and an apprenticeship. and other kinds of, of huh? learning. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, they're interns, and the interns, that's the or reason residents. why. Yeah, and that's the reason why interns exist. But, um, you know, I mean, it, 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 uh, it, it, it's amazing to me that older people are not considered hireable. I'll tell you where they're not hireable. This is really strange, okay? Uh, you know, I used to work with comedians a lot, and I know comedy, and I know how comedy works. Uh, uh, although I'm not very good at it myself, but uh, I do know that the older you get, the better you get at that craft. And if you're a writer in Hollywood writing sitcoms, I'm sorry, pal, you're out of work the minute you hit 40. Yes, that's what I, I mean. And, and, and by the and, way, and, it's and, as young and, as I'm not necessarily in uh, in media or Hollywood. But um, age discrimination is known to start as early as 35 for women. Well, the point... And I, you're barely out of school by 35. The point I'm making, the point I'm making basically, is that to me, being funny... To begin with, these people don't have to be seen. So nobody has to see the wrinkles, okay? They sit in a room and they write, all right? So why is there age discrimination in that, I can see where there's age discrimination where you're physically seen and are presented to the public. I understand that. I've gone through it. I'm in the middle of it myself. But, uh, but I, I don't understand in a job where nobody sees you why age should matter. Did you last longer in radio because it was radio and not television than you might have if it were television? I lasted longer in radio because I was stupid and didn't give up. <laughs> you know, uh, I just. But, but I mean, but you I know, just, aside just, from jokes. Well, I just so love the not, business. Would you not, if your show had been on television, do you think you would have lasted as long as you did on radio for the for the reasons we're talking about today? Okay, I did television, but I found as the years went on, I did less and less television. I was asked to do less and less television. But uh -huh. but, uh, but I bet I won I won my two Emmys. I think after I was fifty. Uh, but so you're I, saying it didn't matter. I would say that it mattered in radio, yeah. But you know where it fell apart? I think that you know I was let go five years ago or so at Sirius XM, and I honestly believe it was because of my age. You know, they, they had me sign something saying I would not claim age discrimination. And I said, you know, this is age discrimination in and of itself, having me sign this thing for and age discrimination. And did you sign it? I had to in order to get my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I had 16 weeks worth of money, you know, uh, severance, okay. I wonder if that's legal. I, 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 don't, I don't think it would hold up in court if I decided to sue them, okay. 
But all I'm saying is I, I felt it was age discrimination. I felt that uh, my age was a problem, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it, it played largely into their decision to get rid of me. But, uh, you know, I, I can't prove it. You know, no, you never can. I, and also they've weakened aid, the EEOC, which is uh, the agency which deals with age yeah. discrimination in the workplace. So their what, regulations what, have been kind of washed away. They're not as um, yeah. strong as they used to be. Plus, if an employee who thinks that they've been discriminated against, whether it's age or anything else, um, wants to bring suit, He's paying somebody 500, 800, who knows these days how many hundreds of dollars an hour for an attorney, where corporations and have attorneys, they can spend as much time on this stuff as they want. It's not costing them anything. Right. So just on on money alone, oh. the corporations are way ahead of the employee and have the wherewithal to follow the, you know, to stretch it out for as long as they want. Well, here's the thing, you know, th this is what I was saying. You were saying like I was in radio, so it didn't matter what I looked like. It didn't matter how old I was. <laughs> it just mattered how the, whether the audience enjoyed what I did or not. And that's true. Exactly. But that's not true for the people that I work for who see me every day and they see me getting older. Okay, right. and yes, and absolutely, you know, and they're the ones that make the decision of whether I'm going to work there or not. Yes. Uh, did it affect my performance? Not in the least. I mean, I think my performance has diminished over the years, and my abilities a little bit. But tell it, me how. Tell me how you think. What, tell me what's changed that's not as good as it was was before. Uh, memory, to begin with. Uh, <laughs> I know all well, about that. Well, yeah, no, but when when you're doing when you're doing a talk show. You have to remember stuff. You know, it yeah. gets to a point now where I look at my wife and I say, uh, what's the name of that actor? <laughs> and she goes, I don't know. You know, and it's somebody we both would have known five years ago. You know, right. right? It's some of the stuff that right off the top of my head, my, 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 so far as my comedy timing is concerned, I don't think that's changed. But I have to stop for a second and try to remember either a fact or a person far more than I used to. I yeah. have a little game, a memory game I play with myself now, mm -hmm. is if I am, for instance, if I get up from where I am sitting now yeah. and go in the bedroom because I want a book, let's say, that's sitting on the side of the bed. Mm -hmm. But then I realize, oh, I didn't make the bed this morning. So I'll do that while I'm here. So I make the bed and my little game is, let's see if I remember to take the book with me when I leave the bedroom. And now that you would think that itself would make me remember the book, right? And then I end up back here at the desk without the book. Well, how many times do you, <laughs> how, how much do you, how many times do you go into a room, you're going for something, you go into the room and you stand there and you go, what did I come in here for? Yeah, but I've done that all my life. I don't blame oh, that okay. on age. I mean, you can go back to my 20s and I did that. Yeah. But it's, it's things that, I actually say to myself, now don't forget to bring the book with you. And I do this a couple of times at least every day because it's gone on for so long now. And sure enough, I end up wherever I went back to without what I went to get yeah. every time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I uh, but I, I, I just feel that uh, a lot of my memory uh, things, uh, kind of a problem, you know. Uh, uh, stuff that I have. Have you noticed that they're always, as far as I can tell, and yeah. when we're talking memory, God knows what you can tell or not. Yeah. Um, is that it's it's minor things like remembering the book or the actor's name. There's uh, it's not things like, oh, if I don't hang onto the handrail, I might fall down the stairs. Oh, well, you know, it's amazing the things I do remember. I mean, the long term memory, I still maintain. I mean, I, that's well you know, known. I, it's well known that it's easier for old people to remember things from their past, from their yeah. long ago past, uh, than it is to remember what you had for breakfast yesterday morning. Like I'll tell you what I what I what I have forgotten uh, very recently was who was president of the United States, but that was a good thing. <laughs> so you know. Um, I could have a whole lot to say on that, but maybe not today. Well, you know, I mean, we are living in a banana republic. This is what it li it's like to live in a banana republic, you know, where the dictator says, I can do anything I goddamn want to do, and you can't stop me. 
Hey, after yesterday, after God, his father must have his father must have treated him like shit for him to turn out this way. Um. Yesterday, when when President Trump canceled the sports <laughs> yeah. celebration and decided to have a celebration of America in between. Have you, this morning online, seen all the compilations of all the times he's been on camera singing one of the patriotic songs of America, the national anthem, and he doesn't know the words? He doesn't know the words, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know, I have a guy on our show uh, every night, his name is Phil, and he, uh, he, you know, really he feels that you should stand for the national anthem, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay, sing it for me. And he couldn't. He didn't know the words? Didn't know the words, was afraid to. I said, don't even sing it for me. Say it for me. And he couldn't do it. You know. So come on. You know, if you really love that fucking stupid song, and it is a stupid song, it's not one of the better songs we could have picked as our national yeah, anthem. it's okay. Who cares? Yeah, it was know? 1936. Fine. That's when we got it, you know. But until, and it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, well, well, it was it, it was a, a, before Francis Scott Key wrote a poem. It was a, a, a beer hall drinking song called Anacreon okay. in Heaven. Okay, I don't mind that. That's all you right. Know. What I do mind is that, um, it, it, it's what he's made of that because some football players were protesting something that had nothing to do with patriotism. By the way, that particular team, nobody ever kneeled or didn't honor the national anthem when it was played during their entire season. So he had oh, no he had no reason to pick on them. It's <laughs> you know, it's a weird world we live in now. And he sat there disparaging them, you know, like they were unpatriotic and so on. not once did anybody for that team, Philadelphia I believe it was, take the knee. Not once did they stay in the locker room. They were all out there hands on their chest when the national anthem was playing, and yet that's the team he disparaged. He disinvited them because he knew they weren't going to show up. Right. There weren't enough of them to make a it's party. It's the same it's reason he wrote a letter to Kim Jong-un, because he was afraid Kim Jong-un was going to cancel the summit. So he wrote the letter as a preemptive strike so he wouldn't look bad. I read an opinion piece somewhere. I've forgotten what it was about. It doesn't matter. But it started out... Our snowflake president. <laughs> <laughs> president Snowflake. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love Perfect. that. Perfect. I love that. Hey, listen, I just looked. We've run over the normal time that We've we... We've run over time, yes. We've run over time and we could go on forever. Uh, but, uh, you know, nobody does. No. Uh, this box that I can see on the screen of you that says Alex Bennett on it. Down in the lower left corner. Uh, that's probably. Do you see my picture moving? No, no, no. It's it's something sitting on your desk, and it has your name, Alex Bennett, on it on a white background. Oh, on my desk. Oh, this. Yes. Oh, that's that's a that's a mic flag that somebody made up for me once. It says. Oh, okay. So. Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Well, so I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Hey, absolutely. Uh, nothing like nothing like in talking to an ex-wife, you know. It, it make, well, it makes it makes you feel as though life has resolved itself, you know. <laughs> Come full circle. As Come it full will. circle. I've known you longer than anybody. I think than anybody else alive. I I would say that's true. I had a just quickly. I had a woman I knew who I knew when she was 11 years old and I was like 16 or 17. And then later on in life, we met up with each other again and had a brief affair. And then one day I got the news she died and she was the first person I had ever had sex with who died. I don't know what to say to this, so I'm just going to say goodbye, uh, Alex. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> goodbye, Ronnie Bennett. Thanks, Ronnie. See you in a couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs>